of heaven, build this house now. The glory of heaven, the glory of heaven. Look at what Jesus says about these people in John 12 and Romans 1. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. You know, there's some people, they see all oh, God do all these miracles in life, and they still ask God, will you do it? Or maybe they go to church, and 20 people get healed, and, and one person, their hand gets healed, but the fingers are not yet healed. Well, did you see? That sister, her finger didn't get healed yet. <laughs> but you ignore the signs of the 20 people that God healed. Because why? Your heart cannot take the supernatural that God performs. Watch this. This is what he says. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God or gave him thanks. For their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Jesus performed so many signs, so many signs, wonders, miracles, in their presence. They still would not believe him. Who? The far you see and the sad you see. He said, you hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. You know what signs are because you can see all the signs in nature. But when you see the kingdom of God here and miracles taking place, you see 5,000 people or 4,000 people being fed. You see people's legs growing and people being healed of all kinds of sicknesses. And you're still asking for a sign. Show us that heaven is here. So Jesus has a name for people who attack the miraculous. He has two names for them. Number one, he calls them wicked. Calls them wicked. He says a wicked, and the second name is adulterous. An adulterous generation seeks after their own sign. But no sign will be given to them. So this is what he's saying. Listen, he says, you guys are wicked because when all these miracles are taking place, when all these signs and wonders are taking place, you ignore the miraculous, you ignore the power, you ignore signs and wonders, and you want your own sign. You are wicked and you're an adulteress. What's an adulteress? Somebody who betrays the marriage vows. He says, you have been unfaithful to me, you have betrayed your vows to me, because when I did these miracles, signs, wonders. You rejected them. You wanted your own sign. You claim you belong to me, but you attack the signs, wonders, and miracles that I do. You don't accept my signs, but you want me to give you your own sign. Well, none will be given to you. And he departed. So, is he talking here about signs, wonders, and miracles? No, he's not, because... Immediately after this, he goes back doing miracles, signs, and wonders. In fact, he does even more. So he's saying, listen, he's talking about the demand of wicked people to prove himself to them. You see, there are wicked, adulterous people that want God to prove himself to them. God does not prove himself to anyone. He proves his word is true. Oh, you got to hear that. God does not prove himself to anyone. He proves his word is true. He does. How does he prove his word is true? By signs, wonders, and miracles. You know, there was a man once, uh, uh, his wife spoke to me. He was living in sin. And his wife said, you can't do this. You can't keep doing this. You need to stop this. And this man said to his wife, well, God must come and tell me to stop the sin. Then I'll stop. Yeah, some people. 
God must come and speak to me face to face, then I'll listen. I must see a light in my room, then I'll know God is with me. That's not funny. Oh, it's messing up some people, yeah? So this man said, hey, God must tell me to stop sinning, then I will stop. That wicked and adulterous man, he will get no sign from God. God has already given him his word and has proved his word through many miracles in his life. This is what we talk about a wicked and adulterous generation. People who want their own signs because they don't want to accept signs, wonders, and miracles that God performs. So God says to those people, don't waste your time. I'm not giving you a sign. You have my word. That's the sign. And I'll prove my word through miracles. I'll prove, I'll confirm my word is real because I'll turn up when my son or my daughter preaches. I'll prove it. It's real. I'll prove it. I'll prove it. It's real. I'll confirm my word. I'll confirm my word. I'll confirm my word. But Sadducees and Pharisees, they don't like it when God does signs, wonders, and miracles. This is the spirit, religious spirits that are operating inside the body of Christ today. Woo! Be careful you do not become a Pharisee or a Sadducee by joining religious spirits. Amen. Now, we spoke a lot about religious spirits. We spoke a lot about signs, wonders, and miracles confirming the word of God. God will do, will preach no word through a servant. God will preach no word through a servant without confirming his word. So tell on to your neighbor and tell him this. God does not release a word. God does not release a word without confirming his word. So if I went to a meeting and somebody preached the most beautiful message, the most tickling message, I even got up five times and said, amen, 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 amen. I ran to the altar and gave my car keys and my iPhone, not my laptop, only my iPhone. But God did not turn up. God did not confirm the word. Who did I give my iPhone to? Let's know the truth and let's preach the truth inside the church and get rid of all the fakers. Too many fakers in the body of Christ. Too many. Ooh. So, they are, you know, when I travel throughout, throughout the world, throughout Africa, every person is an apostle. If they're not an apostle, then they're a prophet. It's so hard to find a pastor these days. Nobody wants to be a pastor. They all want to be an apostle or a prophet. So, how do I know if somebody is an apostle? How do I know if it is a real apostle or somebody with a title? The Bible defines what a true apostle is. There's it here. Hebrews 2.4. It says, God bearing witness with them. Through the apostles, with number one, signs and wonders. Everybody say signs and wonders. <laughs> number two, miracles. Number three, gifts of the Spirit. Three things. Signs and wonders, miracles, gifts of the Spirit. What are these three things? They are manifestations of different dimensions of God. You see, God doesn't operate in one dimension. He operates in three dimensions. Okay, you guys know this, you've learned this. The three dimensions of God is the anointing, the presence, and the glory. They are three different dimensions, three separate dimensions. There is no relationship between them. Oh, let me say it to somebody on this side. There is no relationship between these dimensions. God operates in one of the three. The problem is most Christians only understand the dimension of the anointing. Because they only understand the dimension of the anointing, the anointing can only produce the gifts of the Spirit. There's a chair, Hebrews 2.4. It 
It can only produce the gifts of the Spirit. And of course, the famous nine gifts we all know about, right? Prophecy and speaking in tongues and so on and so on. We know those gifts. It can only appear in the anointing. If you, if you step into the next dimension of the supernatural, which is not the anointing, it's called the presence, then you operate in miracles. And if you step into the third dimension of the supernatural, which is called the glory, then in the glory, you can only get signs and wonders. So just to quickly give you, I don't want to go too much into this, very quickly, you cannot get signs and wonders in the anointing. If you only operate in the anointing, you can never see signs and wonders. They do not appear in the anointing. The same way, the gifts of the Spirit cannot operate in the glory. They cannot cross over. Each dimension is independent, and you need to know which dimension God is in in that particular time. You can learn to operate in all three dimensions and move from one dimension to another. Now, it also means, I'll give you a simple example. In the anointing, you can feel the power. In the glory, you can't feel anything. So if you come to a place where you say, whoa, I can feel the glory, that's not the glory. That's a higher level of the anointing. Because you cannot feel the glory. It's a dimension of the spirit. The anointing is a dimension of the flesh. So you have to learn what happens in each dimension, how to operate in each dimension, how to produce the results of each dimension. Are you with me so far? Three different dimensions. Three different dimensions. Each works differently. Now, miracles, for example. Miracles do not operate in the anointing. They don't manifest in the anointing. They manifest in the presence. But pastor, isn't there the working of miracles and the gift of healing? Yes, that is a gift of the Spirit. The working of miracles is not miracles. It's completely different from miracles. Now, let's go further. Uh, let, me, let me give a simple example. In the anointing, healing takes place by the laying on of hands. Why? Because in the anointing, I have to transmit power. So I have to lay hands on you to transmit power into your body. You can only get healed in the anointing when somebody anoints you with oil or they lay hands on you. In the presence, you, in the presence, you can only get healed by the confession of the word. In the glory, you get healed in your seat. No one lays hands on you. That's why in Catherine Schoolman's meetings, because she operated strictly in the glory, people always got healed in their seats. If somebody touches you, it's no longer the glory, it's the anointing. Okay, I'm going too fast with you guys. Now, I just want you to quickly understand the different dimensions. Because according to Paul, in Hebrews 2.4, a true apostle must operate in all three dimensions of the supernatural. So if somebody claims to be an apostle, they must operate firstly in the anointing, Secondly, they must operate in the presence. And third, they must operate in the dimension of the glory. Only if they operate in signs and wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, then only are they called a true apostle. So if somebody says, I'm apostle so-and-so, you, first you say, explain to me the signs and wonders that you operate in. And if they don't know what signs and wonders is, tell them, you don't know what you're talking about. They must operate in the gifts of the Spirit, miracles and signs and wonders. They must, because the, the apostolic is not simply a title. It is a function of the fullness of the, of the supernatural. Many people will call themselves, but you have to be accredited by God in all three. Scripture says Jesus operated in the gifts of the Spirit. We just read in Acts 2.22. Now, I know of many real apostles, people that operate in all three dimensions, and I met a few that don't know what they're doing. But there are people who think that healing is signs and wonders. Healing is not signs and wonders. Healing does not manifest in the glory. It manifests, well, in your seat, yeah. 
But the healing that we talk about is what happens in the presence through miracles. On last Sunday, it was the last Sunday of the month, and while I was ministering this Sunday, it's about two days ago, towards the end of the meeting, my hands got filled with gold. Oh, it's happening again. My hands got filled with gold dust. And then when I touched my iPad, gold dust went onto the iPad, and I got one of the camera guys to come record it. Now, gold dust is part of signs and wonders. That means that we went into the glory dimension. Because you can't get that thing happen in the anointing. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say you go from anointing to anointing. It says you go from glory to glory. Uh, last night, I prayed for a pastor in, in India. So they're, they're a pastor of a mega church there. And, uh, and she was suffering from uh, vertigo and uh, spondylosis and vertigo. She's in India. I'm in South Africa. We are talking to them over the phone on loudspeaker. So I said to her husband, lay hands on your wife's neck, and I'm going to pray for her. So he laid hands on her neck. I'm in South Africa. I'm praying over the phone. She's in India. So I said to her, before I pray, I am, con I am going to command vertigo and spondylosis to go. It will obey my voice. It will go the moment I pray. I said, are you ready? She said, yes. So her husband laid hands on her neck. I prayed. And immediately, she started screaming on the other end of the line. Started dancing in the room. Broke out into speaking in tongues. She said, the spondylosis is gone. The vertigo is gone. How is this possible? Jesus healed her instantly. So here's my question to you. Which dimension of the supernatural did I operate in? Was it the anointing, the presence, or the glory? It was not the glory because there was no signs and wonders. Very good. It was the presence. Oh, you guys are sharp here. It was the anointing. It was the presence. Now I'm going to teach you in 2020 how to operate in each of these dimensions. I'm going to teach you how to manifest these dimensions because you need to know how the supernatural works. But remember this. For signs and wonders to appear, it can only appear if God moves into the dimension of the glory. It cannot appear if there's only the anointing. So if people are soaking in the spirit, people are falling down and getting drunk, signs and wonders can't take place. Because it is not a dimension of the anointing. It is a dimension of the glory. Three dimensions. We need to know each of these dimensions. We need to operate in them. Every Christian must operate in all three dimensions. We only get stuck in the anointing. And the anointing is like for children. There are deeper levels of the supernatural we need to operate in. Amen. So now, let's look at the importance of signs and wonders. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father that will be enough for us. Show us the Father. This is one of Jesus' disciples. And Jesus answers this, Do you not know, Philip, even after I've been with you for such a long time, I've been with you for three and a half years, everyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I say to you, the words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who's doing the, His work. Believe me when I say, I am in the Father and the Father in me. Right? So one of his disciples says, show me the Father. And Jesus says, hold on. Have you not heard my word? Have you not heard what I preached? Have you not heard what I've taught? Have you not heard my parables? How can you ask me to show the Father? Then Jesus says something very, very interesting. 
or at least. Everybody say, or at least. What does he mean? So, you want to you know the Father. I preach to you. I preach to you. If you don't accept the truth of the word, watch this. If you don't accept the truth of what I've been speaking, the word I've been speaking to you for the three and a half years, if you don't expect, if you don't trust the truth of the word, you don't have faith in the word, at least, at least, believe in the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus says, believe my word. It shows I'm the son of God and that the father is in me and I and the father are one. But if you're struggling to believe the word of God, if you're struggling to believe what God's word says, then I have created evidence for you. The evidence is signs, wonders, miracles, healings, which Jesus calls his works. Verily I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now watch what Jesus is saying. He's saying, listen, if you're struggling to believe the word of God, at least, Believe the evidence that the word is true. What is the evidence that the word is true? The works, signs, wonders, miracles, healings is the evidence of the works. He says, option one, just believe the word. But if you're struggling to have faith, then option two, believe the signs, wonders, and miracles that prove my word is true. This is what Jesus called evidence. So signs, wonders, healings, miracles are necessary to prove the word of God is true and to build our faith in God's word. That's what he's saying here. So in a church where signs, wonders, and miracles are absent, having faith in God and his word will be a struggle for many. In this environment, religion takes over as a substitute for works. Religion replaces signs, wonders, miracles. Because it's absent. So religion becomes the answer. But in a church where signs, wonders, and miracles are normal, people's faith becomes strong and they grow closer to God. The works prove the reality of God and his word. Jesus goes on further to say this. He now shows the relationship between God's word and his works. He says this. If you believe me, there's, where's it there? Whoever believes in me, if you believe me and my word, then the signs, wonders, miracles I've been doing, you too will do. So if you believe the word of God, the evidence that you actually believe the word of God is you will do signs, wonders, miracles. Oh, this messes up a lot of people now. Well, I don't need to do the supernatural. I want to be a normal human. Well, why must people fall down? You know, Christianity is caught up in people falling down. If you believe me in my word, then the signs, wonders, and miracles I've been doing, you too will do. You won't just talk about it, you will do it. The demon of religion says people are running after miracles. But Jesus says miracles, signs, wonders, and healings is the result of faith in him and his word. He then goes on to say not that you're not only doing the works I've done, but greater works than this. Why will we do greater works than Jesus? Firstly, because Jesus transfers the mantle of signs, wonders, and miracles to us, the church. And he says he's going to the Father. But secondly, there's the answer right here. 
Why will you, Jesus fed, now, now what does it mean, greater miracles? Simple language. Jesus fed 5,000 people with how many loaves? Uh, one is five loaves and two fish, right? So let's say five loaves, two fish, he fed 5,000 people. God expects you to feed 20,000 people with five loaves and two fish. That's greater works. Jesus calmed one storm. God expects you to calm every tsunami. Greater works. Jesus raised a few people from the dead. God expects you to raise at least about 30 people from the dead. Greater works. Oh. Greater works. But pastor, why does God expect that of me? Why does God want me, little me? I came so innocent to church. I just wanted to have a Bible, pay my tithes and go home. Why should I operate in signs, wonders and miracles, but get into greater miracles than even Jesus did? Because he now gives the answer. This is what he says. You will do greater miracles than these because I'm going to the Father. I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified through the Son. Oh, you didn't get that. The reason you do signs, wonders, and miracles is because it brings glory to God the Father. Every miracle brings glory to God through Jesus Christ. Every time somebody gets healed, glory goes to heaven. Every time somebody's delivered, glory goes to heaven. Glory goes to heaven. Glory goes to heaven. Glory goes to heaven. He says, I'm going to the Father. He wants the Father to be glorified through him. Then he makes an important statement, and you've got to hear the statement. Ask anything, anything dealing with signs, wonders, and miracles, healing in my name. I will do it. I remember the very first time I saw someone's leg grow. I was in a church called Shekinah Temple in, uh, in the south of Durban, a place called Chatsworth. And I was preaching, and the very first time I preached in that church, I think I preached on faith. And then my message was over. In those days, I thought, when they call you to preach, you're supposed to preach. I didn't know you're supposed to preach and demonstrate. Nobody taught me that. Because I saw everybody just preach. I thought all, you can, all you're supposed to do is preach. But preaching doesn't go on its own. If it goes on its own, it's called a speech. It's a speech. It's a good speech. But all it was was a speech. So I thought, the meeting is over. Can't pick up my Bible. I'm about to leave. And they...